Okay, a very warm welcome from the tropical town of Münster, Germany. Uh, I am glad you joined us all over the world. Uh, um, this is going to be very exciting. We have um, expert, uh, outstanding experts uh, as usual, but today uh, we have a unique feature. Our speakers are not ophthalmologists, they are computer experts. And why is that? Because we are talking about artificial intelligence and how it is disrupting ophthalmology. Um, the older generation, like me, may um, be aware of these computers. This was my very first computer. I got it in 1982, 40 years ago. And I was very proud of this um, wonder machine and uh, I spent every three minute with it. However, back in those days, AI was just science fiction. This computer was quite basic and that was literally the name of the language we used to program it. It was quite elusive that such a computer would one day beat the best chess player because for the game of kings, you need intuition, right? But it took just 15 more years until a computer did just that, beat a chess player. And then um, what happened was people said, well, where's the big deal? Um, in 2011, IBM's Watson computer won the TV game show Jeopardy. And once again, people said, well, that's no big deal. In June of this year, the Washington Post reported that an engineer at Google argued that the firm's, firm's Lambda AI model may have become sentient. Once more, people said, no big deal. Just a few days ago, it was reported that an IA model named AlphaFold can predict the three-dimensional shape of every protein known to man just by looking at the sequence of its amino acids. And I mean 200 million proteins. At least I think this is a big deal. And I think this could revolutionize not only biology and medicine, but our whole lifestyle, starting from carbon in the atmosphere and plastic in the oceans, it could change our whole life. And without further ado, I am happy um, that now we have two experts in the field who are going to show us how AI will disrupt our lives as ophthalmologists. First, we will start with um, Siamak Yosefi. Siamak is assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Department of Genetics, Genomics and Informatics. And he's the director of the data mining and machine learning lab at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Siamak, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction, Sophie. So um, today I'm going to just yeah, talk about briefly on applications of AI in, in the anterior segment, mostly focus on, on uh, Kratokonus. Uh, first, uh, I have a number of grants from National Institute of Health, National Eye Institute, uh, and from uh, Bright Focus Foundation and Re Research to Prevent Blindness, but none of those have any uh, conflict with this talk. Uh, I want to thank all of my uh, collaborators, uh, uh, great people in Corneal Research Network, an initiative that we have started back in 2018 with uh, Hidenori, and now it has uh, more members. Uh, we uh, welcome people with uh, corneal data or expertise in deep learning to join us and then just yeah, working together uh, for, for publications. So uh, a brief overview of AI. Uh, yeah, is the science of developing computers in order to think or act humanly or rationally. So this is the broad uh, term for, for artificial intelligence. And then it has a number of uh, methods like machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence and is defined as the science of programming computers so they can learn from data and they can adapt to new circumstances. We have 
different types like supervised that the data has labels and models there are class labels from data and also unsupervised models that data has no labels. So this is very important for large data sets without label. Uh, these models are very, very, very effective and useful. Model finds hidden structures in data. Uh, and then we have deep learning that is very hard these days. Uh, it's uh, it's an, uh, a construct that process input data somehow like brain. So it gets input image and then make the diagnosis. So made has made everything super easy. Um, so uh, let me just yeah, go through evolution of AI and corneal and retinal imaging system. Uh, I mean, both at the same time on a timeline. Uh, in 50s, uh, 1850s, actually, ophthalmoscope was invented by Helmholtz. And then in 1880s, uh, we had placidos, this that was used for a corneal assessment. And then in 1910s, that fundus camera was invented. So these two are for, for retina mostly, and this is for, for cornea. In 40s, we had the birth of AI. I'm going to talk briefly about this in the next few slides. In 50s, actually, we had the early uh, the early efforts in quantifying retinal images uh, from the modality of the time that was television ophthalmoscope. Uh, in 60s, uh, fluorescent angiography was uh, introduced to the field. In 70s, we had early applications of AI in retina and not in, in cornea yet, actually. And so, um, and then in 80s, uh, we had confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy was introduced again to the field of ophthalmology. Then in terms of AI, we had the emergence of expert system in ophthalmology, mostly uh, processing digital images, finding some, uh, finding and quantifying some uh, factors for, uh, for example, for retina bruise and exudate and for cornea, corneal irregularities, and then making diagnosis. In 90s, we had uh, the first applications of machine learning actually over here that was applied on visual fields. Still uh, no uh, machine learning, I mean, uh, uh, in, uh, in 80s in, in cornea, but in 90s, we have a couple of models in cornea as well. So in terms of imaging technologies, optical coherence tomography was introduced, digital fundus photography was used versus analog. We had uh, ultrasound by microscopy and optical cross-section in tomography of the core uh, uh, of the cornea. So this uh, this also helped a lot for uh, diagnosing uh, many corneal conditions. So in 2000s, actually, we had more complex integration of expert systems and machine learning. Means that a combination of image processing to finding uh, and quantifying. Uh, factors and then learning those factors using a machine learning model to uh, detect pathology. Uh, anterior segment OCT for, for cornea was introduced in 2000s. In 2010s, in terms of imaging instruments, OCT and geography was introduced for glaucoma, uh, for, uh, for cornea, a sh uh, corneal imaging based on shift lock technology was introduced. And in terms of AI, this is actually the turning point. Deep learning models were, were introduced and they were emerged as the uh, most used uh, modality, a uh, most used method actually of AI. They get the image, I mean, as the input, for example, fundus, OCT, topography of cornea or visual fields, and then make the diagnosis on the fly. In, in 2020s, we have new applications, validation and integration for sure. So evolution of the AI briefly in, in 40s, as we said, the initial ideas form. I will jump to 2000s, that emergence of large data sets and computers, particularly GPUs, allowed the next decade of development of very deep learning models like AlexNet in 2013, that some of these models actually exceeded human expertise level. Uh, as I said, in 2020s, we have integration and deployment. So uh, in terms of FDA approved devices, uh, most of the devices that have received FDA approval in healthcare, they are in in radiology, and that makes sense because that's the most intensive imaging modality uh, in uh, in healthcare and uh, and in medicine. Then cardiology and neurology, ophthalmology is pretty much fourth rank. Two devices have received FDA approval yet, both in diabetic retinopathy, none in cornea. So cornea is behind pretty much from those. This is one of the. I will start with Crotoconus. This is yeah, one of the early models in Crotoconus that is an expert system, actually. Uh, it just yeah, uses a number of corneal parameters and based on if-then rules, it just makes diagnosis, uh, identifies two different groups, non-Crotoconus, central steeping, and peripheral steepening Crotoconus. Uh, then uh, we have a number, I mean, 
other models were introduced later, I mean, from year 94 all the way to 2018. Uh, this is the model that I just explained. It's an expert system that makes the diagnosis. The accuracy was 96%. Uh, this is the model that we introduced a couple of years ago, uh, which is based on unsupervised machine learning. Uh, so um, uh, this is and this is the only unsupervised among all of these. Uh, the other models are supervised. We just yeah, introduced it. Pretty much the first unsupervised model. These are the two models that use I mean large subsets. For example, over here, over 3,000, over 3,000, but the rest of models, they have used I mean, a couple hundred uh, samples at most. Uh, so then deep learning models actually make diagnosis, as I said, based on just getting the corneal topography and then making the diagnosis. So for, for Cretaconus, they have uh, published, they have been published uh, now many papers, actually. So yeah, these are a number of papers that have been published in this area based on the deep learning for diagnosing Cretaconus. So Alex is a member of our team as well. Uh, and then, I mean, uh, the others have published a uh, number of papers. Uh, Hazen is also uh, one of our members. Uh, Ali is, is one of our team members. And this is the paper that we published, I mean, uh, last year uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. I'm good. I'm going to say quickly explain how these models work. So this is the model that we developed based on three different groups, normal, suspect, and critoconus. Seven corneal maps based on Pentacam are fed to a deep learning model. Over here, we first extract the features. Otherwise, it is possible to just yeah, directly work with one of these and then make the diagnosis. But to make the model more robust and accurate, we use seven different deep learning models. They extracted features, and then we fuse these features. And then uh, we had two different scenarios, one for binary class and then one for tree class. And then you have made a diagnosis. These are the area under the, uh, these are the receiver operating characteristic curves or in short ROCs that the closer to top left corner, the, uh, the better the model and the more accurate the model. Uh, so, um, and uh, these confusion matrices uh, show the misdiagnosis over here. Most of the samples were diagnosed correctly. Just two samples were uh, diagnosed incorrectly over here for normal and for criticalness, just three um, uh, cases were, were diagnosed incorrectly. In the three class problem, pretty much we had a great accuracy as well. So these are, uh, so this uh, shows the areas that were, uh, the maps actually of uh, some of the cases that were uh, misclassified to just uh, show how these models also make errors. So this was the model. So now just a couple, uh, I mean, other models in, re in refractive screening. Over here, uh, uh, I'm just here showing two methods that were used to, uh, to detect, for example, corneal lactasia based on artificial intelligence. It's a paper by Renato Ambrosio team. I'm sure that yeah, many of you know him. Uh, and then another paper uh, that uh, just uh, uses machine learning to automatically identify candidate patient for corneal re uh, refractive surgery. Both of these models are classical models, no deep learning models. So for infectious uh, cretitis, a couple uh, papers actually, I'm just here showing over here. Uh, in the first paper, they use a, a classical model. They extract textures. They uh, obtained an area under the RC curve of close to 0 0.99. Over here, they use a deep learning model. And again, based on this deep learning model also, they got a very good accuracy of 0 0.98 in terms of area under the RC curve. For corneal transplantation, a couple models, the last one is, is actually our paper. So uh, the uh, two just, uh, in the first paper, they just uh, use uh, deep learning uh, to detect graph detachment in DMIC uh, or platyplasty. Uh, and then uh, in the second paper, they just yet try to see that uh, whether rebobbling uh, is required after uh, uh, cratoplasty. This is a paper by, by Hidenori. He's also part of our team as well. So in this paper, we just uh, try to see that whether it is possible to, uh, to detect a future cratoplast from baseline data or from topography data. Um, and uh, this model is also based on conventional models. So uh, I'm going to see. I conclude by uh, most of the AI models in ophthalmology are geared towards retina and not cornea, and most of the uh, researchers tend to use or overuse deep learning. Uh, while uh, I mean, other uh, unsupervised models also can generate interpretable models and also explainable outcome. Uh, and uh, for sure, innovative AI models are desired to address fundamental questions underlying uh, eye conditions and particularly corneal conditions.
Thank you, Siamak, for this excellent talk. Um, let's continue with the second talk um, um, from the um, posterior segment of the eye. Um, I'm happy to announce Manuel Opitz, uh, AI for the detection and treatment um, planning of wet AMD. Go on, please. Thanks for having me. And let's now look into the posterior segment, as Supi just said. Um, so why are we looking at the posterior segment? And I mean, Siamak just said, Professor Yusefi just said, uh, there are a lot of applications in retina. And this is probably due to because a lot of the reasons why still people go blind around the world, especially in Western countries, are relating to those retinal diseases. This is very different in emerging economies in other countries, but especially North America or the European Union, the main reasons for blindness are happening in the posterior segment. And um, there are a lot of challenges still around. We have this wonderful anti-VEGF therapy for 15 years now, which has enabled us to treat a lot of main reasons, but still there is a lot of decision error happening in uh, retinal diagnosis. And I don't really mean this in a disrespectful way. It's actually something if you compare it to a lot of other specialties in medicine, like radiology, the accuracy we already achieve in ophthalmology is much, much higher. So for instance, if you ask two radiologists to, to have a diagnosis on an image, you get uh, an agreement of 70%. In retina, it's around 85%. So it's really, really high, thanks to this high expertise. But it's still a challenge because a lot of people, they might be overtreated or undertreated, or there might be a misdiagnosis. And this yeah, I guess man will just explain. I mean, yeah, the clinical the clinical explanation behind this. Um, um, most of the yeah, blinding eye diseases just are due to I mean uh, posterior disease or retina. Maybe the other reason is that for for retina, particularly for fundus images, we have great databases and great data sets. Just assume Kaggle. I mean, was performed maybe about ten years ago, but uh, they had at the time they had. Uh, and databases with over 100,000 fundus images. But in cornea, uh, we, we were uh, a little bit behind and we didn't have access to large data sets uh, and deep learning models, as you know, they are very uh, image hungry. They yeah. need images and they need videos. So uh, for, yeah, for the areas that we don't have access to those, maybe we can't uh, just yeah, implement those models. Yeah. I think what uh, Professor uh, uh, Siamak, uh, sorry, Professor Yosefi just said is exactly also one of the points we have seen. So if you look at the uh, applications of AI in retina or here the posterior segment in total, we can look at, for instance, the disease types they are looking for or screening for, as well as the modalities. And as Professor Siamak just said, the vast majority is using 2D fundus imaging because we really have those large data set which are publicly available. So they lend itself to research and it's um, a well-established technology. However, over the last 10, 20 years, we have seen also growing amounts of OCT data. So three-dimensional imaging. And that's something I will come to later because that's what we use. There are also a lot of other modalities now coming into place. So a lot of companies and startups, especially looking to use, for instance, smartphones with something like, like an enhancement to take pictures um, from the back of your eye, or they also use games, which actually don't really have, they don't look into the eye, but just based on what you can see on, on the screen, they try to diagnose or screen for certain kind of disease. And if you look now at the distribution, um, the majority also of players, they are addressing early stages of the disease. So they look for to find out in general if there's AMD or diabetic retinopathy or some, some issue around glaucoma. But there are fewer companies who really try to focus on the late stages of the disease which require treatment like wet AMD or neovascular AMD, diabetic macular edema, retinal vein occlusion or geographic atrophy. Um, I will try to make those statistics now in two uh, different uh, visualizations. The first one is like this. Of course, there are a lot of, as I said, there are a lot of companies looking at 2D fundus photos, and it's usually around diagnostic support. Then there have been some, some works around improving imaging, especially OCT imaging, especially also by players who are already in this area, like companies like Zeiss. And then very recently, and this is also a second generation of startups, they are all much younger compared to the ones you see on the left side. 
um, with, with company like AirDoc who are already on the stock exchange or Dig Digital Diagnostics, IDX. So those younger companies, they try to make something vendor in, uh, independent. They really try to hook into existing PAX systems and use the OCT imaging data to provide something around diagnostic support or even going one step further towards personalized therapy, which you can only do if you can look inside the retina and not just on the fundus. Another visualization um, would be here on the next slide. So here we have a bit this patient journey. And of course, also I think here in the round, we have uh, people who are involved in this. So there are a lot of startups addressing screening. Um, and I think this is really, really helpful that, uh, but it's not addressing really uh, the clinical need of, for instance, an ophthalmologist or even a retina specialist. This is more a support tool for general practitioners, optometrists or opticians. We have identified that there is a need and actually maybe you can call it a blue ocean or there, there is something missing around AMD therapy. And this is something where we try to address um, with our tool. So one last point here is why now? Well, as we already heard, there has been a lot of fundus photography in the past and now the new gold standard, the imaging gold standard in retina is OCT. So those are uh, recent statistics from 2020 in the European Union, but I'm pretty sure it's the same uh, in the US. So really now all the retina specialists, they use OCT imaging. And this has really changed also um, the data we get. And also like this, we need to change the AI models that we use to use those 3D imaging and not just fundus uh, photography anymore. And there is a second trend beside this, which is of course, second generation of more potent treatment options coming to the market, like Fersimab or ILEA in eight milligram dosing or even the PDS system. So that's something very interesting. We have now for the high flyer cases, so patients needing a lot of treatment for wet AMD. We have now new options. The question is just which patient needs it? And that's a question we also try to answer with AI. And we have heard already about um, predictive AI algorithms and the high AUCs we can achieve right now from Professor uh, Yusefi. So I won't go into detail here anymore. So let's look at the use case um, uh, our doctors have picked. 12 years ago, they started to build up one of the first teleophthalmic networks in the world. So by now there are uh, 63 uh, general ophthalmologists hooked up to one central eye center, which is delivering more than 14,000 uh, anti-VEGF therapies per year. Um, some years ago, like 2018, companies like Novartis started to gain interest into this data and supported the AI research of those doctors with a grant. And since then, not only first AI model has been developed, but also first study, first publications. Last year, there was this created the spin out, which I'm as part of, the Biomedical uh, GmbH, and we launched our first web app. And by now, we have a small team working and delivering continuously a lot of clinical studies. And our next goals are, of course, and this is very challenging goals, we want to bring it into the hands of ophthalmologists. Right now, it is only used for retrospective analysis for pharma companies, for payers, for, for doctors' associations, for quality assurance purposes. It's not used live on a patient. That's very important to know, unless we have this e-marking FDA approval, which is targeted for end of next year. Um, the AI models we have developed so far, there are five different models. I mean, we did a lot of more experiments, but those are the ones we think are most promising and they are really around the treatment process. So the first one confirms if this is truly a wet AMD. So it aims to reduce misdiagnose. The second one is to make sure as a second opinion, again, if there's an imminent treatment need or if I can also extend out the patient in a treat and extend scheme. So that's also something, of course, the doctor already has formed an opinion prior using our tool. So these are more like confirm, confirming AI models. If there's disagreement between the AI model and the doctor, we provide also further analysis. So there can be biomarker segmentation or layer segmentation of the retina to also show which slices of the OCT images are most likely to explain why the AI model might differ from the doctor. In the end, it's always a doctor's decision. So the doctor has to take the decision and make sure this is the right treatment, but we might highlight and reduce some kind of decision error, which might happen under stress, or there might be something overlooked in an image or something else. 
last but not least, and I think this is where at least our doctors are getting most excited about this, our long-term vision. Um, we really also can predict for the future the treatment need of each and every individual patient. And this is something we are, as I said, very excited about and which would also allow to bring into uh, to the patient those more potent new anti-VEGF treatments like fericimab or uh, ILEA 8 milligrams much, much earlier. So we don't have to wait for two, three, four years until we know this is a patient with a high treatment need or low treatment need and 60% already of them have left the therapy, we can directly after the first initial uploading phase make a prediction for the next 12, 18, 24 months. How likely is it that this patient will be one of the 40, 50% needing 10 injections per year or of the 40% which can be easily reduced down to one, two, three injections per year of the normal standard drugs like ranibizumab right now. Um, so how does it look right now? There is a web app. I won't show the full demo right now here, but in principle, you can upload your, your OCT imaging and um, do some quick controls. You can enter some data. This is also a demo, if anyone is interested, which is accessible for everyone. And then there is the prediction as well as the biomarker identification. Yeah. And in the end, it generates a PDF report, which can be printed for the patient but it can also be used for getting reimbursement for the insurance companies or used as a quality assurance documentation uh, and put into the patient file. So, so what is our long-term vision? Our long-term vision is really to connect all the stakeholders which are playing in retina. This is a patient, this is a physician, those are uh, the imaging providers, the pharma, uh, the pharma companies, and also the payers. You see here some symbols of German payers. So our goal is really to make a connection and break down those data silos, which we have right now between all of them. And I think one thing, or maybe the last thing I wanna highlight here um, from our use case, uh, which is very, very important. And I think something which we might also do a bit differently from, from a lot of uh, previous approaches we try to have a really generalizable AI. So we are not just trained on you know, data from one hospital and one machine. We have really sourced uh, data from different hospitals, different machines, and we are integrating into the PAC system. So the web app, which you have seen right now, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show you already how it looks in the PAC system, but we have already successfully integrated into two out of the three PAC systems from Topcon, Heidelberg, and Zeiss. So this means, once we have the CE marking, this system will be live in more than 90% of ophthalmic practices worldwide, all of them who have either Topcon, Heidelberg, or Zeiss PAC system. And I think that's something which makes it really easy to use. Who are we? To finish off, well, as a disclaimer, we have uh, as co-founders the doctors from Münster, some of the retina colleagues from uh, Dr. Taneri here. We have support from, from AI professors here in Germany. Um, the founders team consists of myself and uh, the CTO who has already launched four different medical applications over the last 20 years in software, everything from EEG over ECG to ultrasound. And we are advised by the two largest um, uh, clinics, uh, medical uh, eye clinics in, in Europe from, from Moorfields as well as from the LMU on the AI as well as on the medical side. With this, I would like to finish and here is my conclusion. So we have AI models who can serve as a second opinion, as I said, quality assurance wise to reduce the overtreatment, undertreatment and misdiagnose. In Germany, there is reimbursement for this, which makes it very attractive to bring it to the market here. So you get more money for having a quality assured injection. Second, we can also reduce documentation and make it easier to get reimbursement. That's something very attractive for the US market where there's a lot of hassle at least according to our doctors, uh, once you want to switch drugs, for instance. And third, and this is our long-term goal, we really want to enable this more personalized and need-based therapy by predicting the treatment needs, enabling an earlier optimization of treatment options for retina specialists, so higher dosage drug, for instance. And last but not least, of course, increase the therapy adherence. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Manuel, uh, for this excellent talk. And uh, forgive me for not properly introducing you uh, before the talk. Uh, let me do that now. 
Um, you are the current CEO of Deep Eye Medical, and that's important for full financial disclosure. I'm a minority share shareholder in Deep Eye, um, and you are a health tech entrepreneur and two times TED speaker with an MS uh, Master in Science in Bioengineering um, and in uh, Business Administration. Thank you for this excellent talk. Um, let me ask you directly, when do you think will your system or another system be better than the world champion in retina diagnosis? Um, I mean, for me, it's always a question, what is your ground truth? Right now, we do not benchmark ourselves against a single doctor. We benchmark ourselves versus a reading center. So there are three independent doctors who all grade an image and say, well, you know, it should be this and this. And in the end, they have to discuss and come up with a final verdict on what is there in the image to be seen. And we achieve accuracies depending on the, the five different algorithms. They are very different on this, but we achieve accuracies for some of those uh, diagnostic, let's say, algorithms of 95, 97 AUC, like, like also Professor Yusefi said already. This is quite possible to get almost as good, almost as good as three doctors combined. The question is, in the end, in the real world, do you benchmark yourself versus a doctor? I don't think so, because what we really want to achieve is we make the doctor better. For us, our, our AI is not artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. We augment the intelligence of the doctor and enable him or her to see more faster. And that's something I think, uh, which also we do in our studies that we try to have the first decision by the doctor, the second decision by, by um, our AI, and then there's some disagreement. And in the end, again, the doctor has to decide which is right or wrong, but we really to reduce, try to reduce uh, the, the, that they overlook something. And so I think in the end, it's not the question if we are better than a, when, than a doctor. I think the question is how good can one doctor and one AI be together compared to, let's say, three of the world leading experts in retina. And that's okay. our benchmark we try to achieve. Thank you for this very diplomatic answer to a very naive question. Um, thank you. Siamak, um, we have questions from the audience and maybe you can answer both of them. Um, the first one is from Christina Bornberg. What happens if out of distribution data is fed into the network? Yeah, so that's, that's very important. I mean, typically the AI models, when they see something, I mean, yeah, this is yeah, what we expect from them. If we don't show, for example, images to them, we can't expect, for example, for yeah, for those models to learn and then yet yeah, to be able to just get yeah, diagnosed, right? So if there is one pathology, one particular pathology in, in her term, just out of distribution image is fed to a model that the model has not been trained based upon previously, then we can't expect the model to be able to just make, make a correct or a reasonable diagnosis or just, I mean, uh, decision based on that, right? So the the very, uh, I mean, a quick answer to this question is that if we don't provide those samples to the model, we can't expect the model to be able to uh, make uh, some decisions on those. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, it is possible to address that problem. And to address that problem, we can show the model a representative data set. And by a representative data set, we mean that the data set just goes across the spectrum from, for example, normal, normal, all the way to the end of stage disease. We have samples that the model can see, and then the model uh, most likely is able to just yeah, make diagnosis on, on pretty much, I mean, diverse cases. But this is a very, I mean, challenging question, a challenging problem also into the AI models. Data is very important. Uh, so, I mean, uh, that that is uh, uh, something that, I mean, uh, many people actually uh, have concerns about. Okay. Another question uh, from Daniel Scharkmüller is, do you think we can use anterior segment OCT images for future AI models? And if yes, how could that look like? Oh, for sure. Actually, anterior segment OCT has already been used. I mean, even in glaucoma, in, for example, angle and keratoconus. 
they have been used for for diagnosing i mean a primary angle uh, closure glaucoma or in short uh, a pacg uh, and they can be used for for the other i mean uh, uh, corneal conditions as well uh, we even have, I mean, uh, performed some studies that just yeah, show some links between even glaucoma and the structure. Previously, people have shown, I mean, some, some links between, for example, glaucoma and corneal biomechanic. I mean, in addition to that, we're working on a structure as well. And likely, uh, these, uh, these modalities can tell us more. I mean, there are a number of studies actually in retina. For, uh, for example, in retina, they have shown that based on fundus images, we can predict age, we can predict, I mean, gender, we can predict many other non-ocular factors, even cardiovascular factors, even, I mean, uh, brain diseases, I mean, from, from, uh, uh, from retinal images. I think pretty much the same thing may be uh, possible by the corneal images as well, but pretty much no research. I mean, I still have been, at least as far as I know, that for example, they can, that we can, for example, use uh, anterior segment imaging based on Schimflog, OCT, or the other technologies, I mean, to detect, I mean, uh, 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 some of these factors. But but for sure, they have been used, so we had a short answer. They have been used previously for, for some of the diseases, and there are many opportunities for, for the other conditions as well, yeah. Okay, great answer. Thank you, uh, John. Um, the eye is oftentimes considered the window to the soul. And as Siamak just said, uh, this may be debatable, but certainly the eye is the window um, to into the body. Can we see the heart from the retina? Yes. Um, well, if, if I could back off a little, first of all, uh, what, what we've seen in terms of the posterior segment is the utilization of uh, very large databases using sophisticated algorithms to help us in terms of treatment for advanced disease. But in wet AMD, we're not treating the underlying etiology, we're treating an end stage complication with these vessels. And there's already a very interesting uh, program out there, completely commercialized in uh, Australia, MacuJet, which does precisely that. It, it looks at the images, it looks at the injection regime, and it predicts uh, and helps the clinician make decisions as to how to treat individual patients. I think a much more interesting area is dry AMD, because dry AMD coupled with aging is the fundamental etiology of AMD. Uh, and so here, um, our artificial intelligence programs are hopefully going to provide very early diagnosis, and hopefully we can prevent dry moving to wet. So, so I, and um, it, it's very interesting because a lot of AMD at present takes what the clinician has seen in the past, tells the computer that that's what to look for. And then because of the size of the databases uh, comes up with really great predictions because it may take a hundred thousand doctors and a hundred million patients. Absolutely terrific. But that's not the real gem of AI. The real gem of AI is, in some ways, to put images in and ask the computer to come up with things that we haven't identified before. And that's where it's moving most rapidly. So in a sense, we've already got AI as I've just explained with Macujet, and uh, uh, as we've just heard this evening, going out there into clinics and uh, Tukuiz has, uh, I, I think, systems now in over 70 clinics in India to give predictions on the basis of markers that we already knew about. But where it's moved forward is to take retinal images, which is the only part of the vascular system that one can see readily, 
and to utilize that with the computer asking all sorts of questions that we haven't actually quite fully determined yet to predict risk factors of cardiovascular events in later life. And again, using a very, very large database, we have already a very, very good predictor of cardiovascular events in later life. Not only that, but the cross correlation between factors which are outside our control, i.e. genetics, ethnicity, age, and factors which are inside our control, like blood pressure, cholesterol, etc. So this system has, first of all, given us very high predictability of risk factors. And then secondly, means by which you can actually prevent many of these risks occurring in later life. And, and I think that's the absolutely fascinating thing about uh, AI. It, it, it really is taking us into an area where hitherto we haven't been able to, to move. And I'd just like to say, finally, that um, we've done exactly the same thing in Tuku Eyes. That is, we've done um, deals with uh, optical instrument manufacturers because those are the guys that are going to ultimately produce machines with built-in diagnosis. And at the same time, working with Big Pharma to actually improve uh, patient cohorts for clinical trials, which will be a huge cost saving for startup companies and established companies, and will be huge benefits to patients undergoing treatment regimes, which in retrospect, can do absolutely nothing for them. So I, I'm a great uh, supporter and advocate of uh, AI, both in the front of the eye and in the back of the eye. Uh, but I have to say, my major interest is the back of the eye, because as previously said, that's the whole area where sight threatening disease really is lagging behind. Mm -hmm. And as a senile professor, I have to be very conscious of the onset of age related diseases other than my presbyopia. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, as a serial innovator, what's your take on the talks? And uh, I know you are working on a, a similar project. And in the end, who is going to pay for that? all of that? <laughs> I hope not me. Um, I, I, I think you know, there's, there's always the question, you know, is, is you know, at the end of the day, how can you get a viable business model of this? And I think uh, Manuel mentioned it, you know, as soon as you get into some sort of reimbursement structures, I think it gets viable. I mean, that's as simple as this. Now, why would it get there is uh, usually because you have an impact on the health economic system. You know, you're saving money in the whole system or you're preventing patients to get blind that has an impact on social economic costs. So, these are the usual pathways in, in getting into some sort of reimbursement. I know Germany has that you know, fr free right for everything to be reimbursed at the moment. So if you have some sort of software that's getting reimbursed, it will change probably again down the road. But you know, a sustainable business model, I think, comes down. What is the impact on the social economic cost? Now, I think that's where the retina gets so exciting because you could do just massively more benefit than what you can do in the cornea. Because in the cornea, you know, it, it potentially usually ends up in some sort of a surgery. And, you know, whether you do a kind of transplant, you do other procedures, uh, you know, they're not that cost implicating than what you have in terms of a retinal, you know, massive vision loss. So I think that's why we see more interest in the retina, aside from all the scientific elements you, John, mentioned, I think commercially is, you know, if you can prevent people from getting blind in the age of 60, you know, times 30 years of not being functional or, or spending significant costs of social economic system, here we go for the reimbursement. Where if someone gets a <clears throat> conus, 
in the age of 60 and you do a transplant, maybe you have to do another transplant down the road with cross-linking. We're talking a couple of ten thousands of costs. So I think, I think that's just something we need to consider. Uh, th that's a bit of from my business point of view. I think so for me, AI, I, I, everything that's said, you know, I'm sharing the fascination there since you're pretty much the same age than Sufi. Um, you know, for me, I was looking at this is where, where do we did really have today since 25 years or more day to day application of artificial intelligence. And, you know, some of you guys might know refractive surgery. You know, we're using nomograms since the, the, the early ages of refractive surgery. And what you basically did is you treat an eye, you look at the outcome, you modify your algorithm. Now, there's some software, everything has become more sophisticated, more fancy, more costly. But it's, we're doing this, you know, John, you know that better. Since 30 years, we're doing exactly that approach. So yeah. for me, that's still one of the first applications of using, if you want AI, and I remember the old book from, from uh, George Waring, who actually describes those nomogram things and actually talks about your know, algorithm and learning algorithms. So I think, I think we're doing it in ophthalmology for many, many years, successfully in specific areas. And I think now with uh, having access to data on a much larger scale, access to much more defined data is coming from the machines which i think is a huge benefit especially with the octs we can argue about the topographies but with the octs i think we, we significantly improve the quality of data yeah. i think it, it's it's a fascinating pathway and uh and i think you know there will be more companies in the space but that market is so big it deserves more companies can, can i can i just say guys i'm going to give you a flyer i'm, I'm giving a lecture at uh, Cambridge late this year uh, entitled where did my pla where did my practice go a and this is really AI replacing the diagnosticians and robots replacing the mm -hmm. surgeons uh, and so this really is Skynet and the Terminator so <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to be there in 10 years, but it's certainly something people should be aware of. I saw the first fully robotic cataract extraction, which absolutely astounded me. And if one begins to couple that with the ability of uh, AI for diagnostics in individual cases, I, I think this is a fascinating future. And already, We've seen some of the readers in reading centers have been displaced because of the accuracy and predictability of AI systems. So it, it's an interesting future, guys, and I think you're at the forefront. Uh, so just remember Skynet and the Terminator. <laughs> but, but, I think this... I, I, Sorry, sorry, I have a question to the two speakers is, you know, in Germany, we have to say who measures, we have missed, 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 who measures crap gets crapped. So, you know, you're looking at all these different devices in the market. I know 25 different OCTs, a pro probably a whole series of, of different anterior segment diagnostic systems. How in your model are you adjusting for these different diagnostic devices? In, in how you how you are making sure you're not measuring noise or analyzing noise sorry yeah do you want to go ahead manuel or just start yeah just i mean um we also have i mean yeah this term in in data mining and machine learning garbage in garbage out so it's very important i mean now now there is actually a trend on focusing more on data, I mean, rather than on the models, because I think the models are pretty much mature now and they can handle, I mean, yeah, many tasks. So data is very important. Quality data is very important. The quantity, I mean, the now the quality is more important than quantity, although quantity was at first very important for the deep learning models. As I said, they, they were, I mean, very image hungry, but now there are some models that can work on a smaller samples of data as well. But uh, regarding your question, I mean, yeah, different uh, OCT instruments, uh, different uh, 
the very first problem is that uh, they have different uh, imaging, I mean, uh, types, and it's very hard to, first of all, I mean, in work, I mean, you're working with them. But when you handle that part, the other problem is that they are not, even for example, two different instruments, they, they just uh, give you different uh, global random nerve fiber layer thickness for the same subject. I mean, two different numbers, right? Even they are not, I mean, uh, consistent in terms of uh, measurements and quantitative uh, um, measurements. So this just yeah, makes the problem uh, hard and challenging for deep learning models as well. Now, some of the models work on only one device, I mean, image from yeah, one device, but there are a number of efforts and a number of publications actually. We are working on one based on the corneal imaging to be able to, for example, analyze Cassia, analyze <laughs> Pentacam, analyze Galilei data, it doesn't matter which device, I mean, gets the corneal topography to be able to just uh, get all of these means uh, developing a model uh, a device <laughs> agnostic model that is not dependent on the uh, the image from, from uh, one one instrument and there are a couple publications particularly from uh, if I just yeah, remember correctly from uh, Aaron Lee team uh, back in uh, University of Washington uh, they also have developed a couple models that just gets OCT uh, and then just yeah, makes a diagnosis regardless of the uh, uh, just instrument and also a team at IBM, I guess maybe IBM and uh, uh, NYU, uh, they also have have developed a model that just is device agnostic. Yeah, so there are, I mean, uh, still this is a challenge. Still this is a challenge. For example, for visual field now, I mean, a yeah, visual field of different, uh, I mean, yeah, instruments, ZEISS, I mean, yeah, Humphrey, then Octopus, then the other instruments. Uh, but uh, there are some efforts as well to just address this problem. But, but in the corny, you have a specific problem. Uh, one of the best meetings I've ever been to was held by Rohit Shetty three years ago. And he had one of every corneal topographer down the side of the lecture theater. And every clinician that presented a patient with their pet topographer had to then examine the patient on each of the others. And not only were the changes enormous, but the sign changed. And that tells you the fudge uh, factors that the various manufacturers put in. So I think in cornea, it's particularly bad. In retina, it is slightly easier. Uh, and with automated retinal cameras, um, as we heard earlier, and certainly in our studies, we've used a number of different OCTs and different cameras. And in the retina, you know, you've got nice little key factors in terms of the vascular uh, pattern, etc. But the cornea is, is, is really, and especially as none of these instruments are looking at the central millimeter and a half. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, follow up on that. Because there are two, I mean, yeah, two components. First, I mean, the imaging instrument that just makes and generate the image. And as you mentioned, maybe some instrument makes more noise and they are unable to just yeah, remove the noise. And the other instrument just yeah, generates a higher, I mean, uh, uh, a better actually resolution and accurate images. Then the second component is quantification. Those, I mean, image processing or AI algorithm for quantifying, for example, in the uh, for for OCT for uh, just generating retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. So again, those algorithms also could be different. And as you mentioned, as I said, I mean, even for OCT, there are some, I mean, a discrepancy. There are not consistent in just uh, reporting the thickness of the uh, yeah retina for for two different for for one patient actually for one subject. Okay, um, sorry, uh, we are out of time. Uh, and um, I have to um, stop this very interesting, enlightening discussion. Thank you to the speakers, Yamak. It was a pleasure having you, Manuel. Thank you so much. Great talk. And uh, to all the panelists, John, um, wise comments as always. Michael, we are looking forward to, uh, to your um, excellent comments again. And you were too modest to. Um, announce your own project <laughs> maybe next time okay chris thank you so much and Melly also for the um, organization see you guys next time bye bye thank you so much bye 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 bye, bye. bye. bye.